Well, this morning we're going to continue our Alive series. Last week, Pastor Chad preached on knowing ourselves to know God. And we talked about how we are each uniquely given a role by God to live out. That just like King David was the person to do what he did in the battle with Goliath, so every one of us, God has called us and gifted us and equipped us special for who we are. And this Alive series, we've been on a journey. The idea of being, becoming more alive as we live for God. You know, we live in a culture that allows us to gain a lot of intelligence, a lot of knowledge. We live in a time where there is more Bible knowledge available than ever before. And many of us have really taken advantage of that, and we have learned a lot about the Bible and about God. There's a lot of opportunities for service, things that we can do in the church. And service is very important because as we serve, God matures us as we work together with other believers. But as we look at the idea of maturity, it involves knowing God's Word better. It involves serving, but it also involves what goes on within us, our emotions. You see, we kind of have a dilemma in our church culture today. We have a lot of individuals who know a lot about God's Word. A lot of people who are very busy serving God. But at times, the person who's at church on Sunday is someone different than who they are Monday through Saturday. It's like something happens with a change in personality. That on Sunday we have a real friendly person who loves being with God's people and laughing and making jokes, but when they go home, it becomes very serious. And their family's almost afraid to approach them without fear of getting their heads bitten off. The idea of our live series is bringing together what we know about God, what we're doing in serving Him, and then how we relate to others with our emotions and in relationships. Today I want us to talk about breaking the power of the past. I don't think there's any of us that likes to really go back and look at the past. I know when I think about my relationship with my parents. There were some very good things. My dad taught me the value of financial responsibility. My mother taught me peacekeeping. She was the peacekeeper in the family. But on that other hand, while they taught me some good things, my father also taught me the idea that success was important at any cost. You would almost say failure is not an option. With my mother, she learned to make me feel real guilty. You know the image of the, the Jewish mom in the, in the comedy shows that have New York City characters, the Jewish New York City characters, and the mom that always makes the kid feel guilty? Well, my mom could raise her eyebrow and I knew she was disappointed in me and I needed to change. Well, those things, my dad's definition of success, my mom's sense of pushing me to be motivated by guilt, those all affected my spiritual life. As I began working and serving God, I began realizing success is important. I do things out of guilt. As I began interacting with my family, those messages came through. And every single one of us grew up in homes where there were rules. All of us. The rules may have been spoken, or they may have been unspoken. But the rules exist. On the back of our small group guide, the back says, unhealthy relational messages. 
Now, we're not going to have the time to deal with those today. That's, a, that's something for your small group when you meet this week. But we need to realize that every one of us have messages from our past. And those messages from our past can either help contribute to growing in maturity in Christ, or they can hold us back. It's good to be aware of the messages that we've had from the past so we can choose. What are we going to take in to the next generation? And what is our family going to be like? In the book of Genesis, chapter 50, we have the story of a man who broke the power of his past. The story around this man takes up about 25% of the book of Genesis. He comes from a very highly dysfunctional family that went back literally generations. There was deceit. Multiple wives at the same time. Betrayal. Sibling rivalry. Favoritism. And just about anything else that you would say contributed to a messy family system. His name is Joseph. And he's one of the great characters of the book of Genesis. When you look at his life, his life was a life of traumas. You know what a trauma is? It's one of those events that shake the safety of your world. One of these events that, that wake you up and make a mark in your life that forever stands. The first trauma he had began as a very young man when his brothers, who really did not like him at all, decided they were going to kill him. They threw him down a well as they plotted on how to kill him. And during that whole time, not knowing what the next hour would hold, he was down there, and every time one of the brothers would, would walk by the edge of the well and look down, he wondered, is this the time of my execution? We don't know whether it went on hours or days or weeks, but he was down there to the point that it made a mark on his life. Well, finally, he was brought up out of the well, probably expecting to be killed, but he wasn't. Instead, he was sold as a slave. He began a life as an individual who had a lot of benefits, the favored son, safety in his home. And then he ends up becoming a piece of property. And for the rest of his life, he could have been physically, sexually, and emotionally abused at the will of his masters. The third trauma came about as he ended up being sold off again. He was taken to Egypt and he was sold to a very wealthy man who had this great household. Now in a way this was initially a blessing. For God gave Joseph favor in the eyes of this man. To the point that this man basically turned his entire household over to Joseph. And Joseph was able to make the decisions in the household. And this man totally trusted him. Well, over time, what happened was the man's wife began to try to seduce Joseph. Joseph, out of his fear of God, wouldn't give in to it. Well, the result was she claimed he tried to rape her. And then Joseph was thrown into prison, and for at least the next 11 years, he sat in a prison that's not like the prisons we have today. There were no 32-inch flat screens on the wall. There weren't regular meals. Didn't have yellow or orange jumpsuits to wear. Instead, his food came from whatever he could scrounge out from around the prison. 
His clothes literally rotted off his body as he sat in darkness. Any kind of sickness, his body was beat by it with no medicine to take care of him. For year after year after year, this man went through this. One day, a couple of men showed up in the prison who had fallen out of favor with the Pharaoh. And basically, they were looking and wondering how to get back. And, and they had dreams. And God had given Joseph the ability to interpret dreams. And so these men said, if you will interpret our dreams, when we get out of here, we'll let everybody know about you and get you out of here. Well, that sounded like a good idea. And Joseph interpreted their dreams, and it came about just like he had said. But they forgot about him. So there he continued to sit in this dark, dungeon-like prison. Well, one day, the Pharaoh had a dream. And nobody was able to interpret it. Pharaoh called his wise men and asked for the interpretation, and they were all stumped. And in that day, if the Pharaoh wanted an answer to his dream, he got an answer to his dream, or heads would roll. And so these wise men, they were panicking. Where can we find somebody who can interpret a dream? And then somebody remembered Joseph. So Joseph was brought out of the prison, washed, fattened up a little bit, put on some nice clothes, and taken before Pharaoh. And the long story is, he told Pharaoh that his dream meant that Egypt would have seven years of abundant harvests, the food would flow, but then that would stop. And then there would be seven years of drought and famine. Pharaoh, recognizing that God was with Joseph, basically turned the, the country over to Joseph and gave Joseph the responsibility to prepare for that 14-year period of both plenty and for famine. Well, if Joseph goes through this time, I dare say his past had not totally left him. As with all of us, when we look on, back on the trauma of our past, it's hard sometimes to escape it. But then one day, his brothers show up. The guys who had been the beginning emphasis in his life. The guys who originally started this, this flow of trauma into his life. They showed up hungry. And so now Joseph was faced with a decision. Was it payback time? He had the power to. But you know, we don't see that in him. That's not how he approached his brothers. What we see in Joseph is an individual who the past had been dealt with. A man who, as he tested his brothers and he looked at their hearts, he was able to become a blessing to them rather than punish them. After his father died, his brothers came back to him. They're afraid again. Now that dad's not here any longer, what's going to be Joseph's response? Is it big time payback? Well, what we're going to read this morning in Genesis 50, and it's page 44 in the Bibles under the chair. What we read is... Joseph's response to his brothers. After all he had been through and after all they had contributed to the grief in his life, this is the response that Joseph gives. 
In Genesis 50, we're going to read verses 15 through 21. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, now I'll let you decide whether dad really did say this or whether they were trying to save their hide. Your father gave this commandment before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sins because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. And then it says, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. Now look at Joseph's response. It says, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph is an entirely different man than his brothers expected him to be. They expected revenge. But yet they were faced with a man who had risen above in maturity. And his maturity had risen above the trauma of his life. I think there's three things that contributed to what went on with Joseph. Three applications that I think we can see. And I think we can apply these to our own lives. Because every one of us has things in our past that when we look back on it, we need to take a close look. Things that are driven by family rules. Things that's driven by fear out of trauma. Events that we were truly innocent with but yet we suffered. And I think the first application is that I need to recognize my icebergs from my family. I need to recognize my icebergs from my family. Now you might say, what is it about icebergs? You remember when we started this series, Pastor Chad put a graphic up on the screen? And it showed this gigantic iceberg floating in the ocean. 10% of it above the surface. 90% of it below the surface. And the idea is most of us are like that iceberg. We let people see 10%. And it's usually that good 10%. It's not the 10% my wife gets to see. It's not the 10% my kids get to see when I get mad. It's a 10% that makes me socially acceptable to everybody and the good Christian pastor that I am. But every one of us has 90% below the water and so do I. What I think we see in Joseph is that he wasn't someone to go blaming people from his past. That's never the thing to do. Every one of us, we're accountable, and we're responsible for how we live our lives. But there's also an understanding that what we have experienced in the past contributes to how I deal with life today. 
Let me say that again. What I have experienced in the past contributes to how I live life today. We talked about the rules. Every family has the rules, either spoken or unspoken, and in Joseph's case, the rules said scheming and betrayal is just perfectly acceptable behavior. If you want something in life, you scheme, you betray whoever you have to to get it, because the end justifies the means. Every one of us has family rules just like Joseph had. If Joseph would have given to his family the rules that were his family rules, his brothers had good reason to fear. If Joseph had stuck with the rules of his family, his brothers rightly came before him thinking about revenge because that's what the rule of the family was. Revenge is good. But Joseph says, I'm not doing it that way. What I'm giving to my family, what I'm giving to the next generation is a new set of rules. And I want to challenge you to think about your life. If there were things in your family growing up that made you angry growing up, that beat you down, that made you feel less important, I would challenge you to look at those things and say, is this what I want to bring into my next generation? Somebody has said that an emotionally healthy person isn't the one who has his family past and all figured out. He is the person who's not afraid to look at his past and admit he doesn't have it all together. Guys are probably worse about this than females. Guys, we like to say everything's okay and remain tough. Show emotion? I don't think so. But you know what? The stuff that hurt us growing up is the same stuff that will hurt our children if we push it forward. The things that hinder spiritual growth is not just not knowing how to live for God and know God's Word. It's not just not serving God and isolating yourself away from the people of God. But it's also emotionally remaining immature when God is calling us to maturity in relationships with other people. So we need to recognize my iceberg. I have to do it. You have to do it. We all do. But there's a second thing here. And that is that I need to discern the good that God intends in, through, and in spite of my family. How did Joseph get to the point where he could say, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good? It's easier to see the good in the things that happen around us when we've not had a lot of bad things happen. But you know, it's hard to entertain the idea of good coming out of bad when our past includes abuse, rape, neglect, poverty, or something like unexplained death. 
I can't sit up here today and give you a bunch of easy answers. I wouldn't insult you like that. There is a mystery here that goes beyond anything we could quickly explain in 10 minutes. God is a God who... is a God of mystery. God holds people responsible for their actions while at the same time He's totally sovereign. He's the God who is able to take that which in evil that people intends to hurt other people with And somehow in his magnificent, all-knowing way, take that sin that so is so against who he is and break into our lives and make something out of it that can glorify him. I'll be honest, I don't know how he does it. I've had situations in my life that I went on sometimes for decades angry about. And then I noticed one day that that situation that happened 10 years ago has allowed for something to happen today that is good. Now, would I wish anybody to go through what I did go through? No. But God took something that somebody meant evil for and he turned it around and made something good. That's what Joseph is saying here. That we have the privilege of knowing a God who when people in their evil abuses children, commits crimes, hurts people, And that hurts the heart of God. But that God is able to put all those broken pieces back together into something that can be beautiful. It doesn't happen easily. Because we have to begin by pausing to grieve what we've lost. That's one thing you see here in Joseph. You see it in the way he names his kids. This first child, Manasseh, his name means forget. He's looking back. He's dealing with what happened in the past as he looked at this child. He said, I think about what happened to me as a child, and here I have one. I'm going to name him Manasseh, looking back. And then, during then, in the time of the birth of his next son, he names the next son Ephraim, which means blessing. Something has happened in the heart of Joseph. He's gone back, and he's looked at the pain of his past, and then he's, he's moved forward, and now he's looking to the future with naming his son a blessing. But also in this, I think he came to rest in his knowledge of a sovereign God. He probably struggled with understanding what God was all about. Theologically saying, you know, God works all things together for good. And wondering, I don't get how that works, God. You say it. And then one day, In the middle of a famine, his brothers walk in. And they say, we need food or our entire family's going to die. And Joseph's able to pause and say, you know, if I hadn't got to this point, if I hadn't been in prison, if in prison people didn't come to know me as one who could interpret dreams, 
if I hadn't been in Potiphar's house and accused falsely, I never would have been in the prison where God could use me. And had my brothers not treated me that way, I never would have gotten to Egypt so that now I can preserve the family from dying. Was it fun? No. Is the journey hard? Absolutely. But as Joseph looks at his life, he says, you meant it for evil. But guess what? God has used it for good. And I think the last thing, the last application is that I need to make the decision to do the hard work of discipleship. Joseph didn't get to where he was by accident. He had to look at his life. He had to do some work, personal stuff. And I think there's three things that I think he really worked on, and I think it's the three things we need to think about. And the three hard works he went through is, first of all, I think he acknowledged the power of his past. He settled down and recognized that to be emotionally healthy, he had to understand the influences of his past and how it made him who he was today. And evaluate those influences honestly. And, it, and it's not just family. Sometimes it's events. Sometimes it's important people in our life. Sometimes it's situations that were out of our control. But it's looking back and saying, what did that have to do with who I am today? Then grieve the losses of the past. In the same way Joseph named one son forget and the other one blessing, We have to go through that process of looking back and legitimately grieving the hurts and pains of the past. And then we need to look for God's hand in accepting the past. It's not easy. And one of the things we don't want to fall into is focusing so much on the trauma and the hurt that we're not able to see when God breaks the good into our life. But that's the challenge of the growth. You know, if it was just Joseph, that would be one thing. But in Joseph, we have an, an image of Christ, almost a type Joseph was betrayed by the people who loved him. And the same people who betrayed him, he later was the savior of by providing them food. You know, we think about Christ. He came to this earth totally innocent, loving us, wanting only our best. And what he got was crucified. But in all that Christ went through, he arose the Savior. And he's the one that gives us life today. Jesus died that we might have peace with God and relationships one with another that would honor him. I want to challenge each of you. I want to challenge you to take time to look at the icebergs from your past. Look at that iceberg. Look below the surface and say, what are the messages I received that I really don't want to pass on to the next generation? And then pause to grieve and say, you know, those things growing up, some of it wasn't good. But then acknowledge God's hand in that you are who you are today because of all that you've been through. Let's pray.